Welcome, folks. Good to be here with you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Denise, do you want to start right in talking with folks about making the switch over or you want to wait for a minute? I was hoping to wait for everyone to get on. Okay. Just so we're not in the middle of doing that while people are still logging on. I have no idea what we're doing. Does that Sounds work? Good. Yeah. Chris and team, I just want to confirm that there's a chat that we can use among us panelists that I've just put something in just to let you know. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, thanks, Jenny. Oh, and that's through the through Zoom. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Jisoo. Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me here. Um, I think your your pals are about to hop on video as well. Okay. We just ask it'll be um, interactive. I'll, we'll explain it in a second, but if you could stay on video, that'd be great. Yes, ma'am. Sounds good. Hi, Jisoo. I'm Jenny. Great to meet you, and thanks for participating. Hey, how's it going? My name is Jisoo. Great, great to have you guys here. Thanks for having me. Hi, Jisoo. Okay, I'm going to switch Hi. over to my computer real quick. So it looks like we have 20 attendees. We can, and it's not rising, so we can start now. Okay, great. Um, so welcome to everyone who's on this uh, webinar tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name, we'll do some quick introductions. Why don't we do it now? It seems the right time. So my name is Denise G. I am um, a minimally invasive uh, surgeon and bariatric surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and really excited to be able to deliver this um, webinar to all of you um, tonight. And I'm working with some of my esteemed colleagues and some of your um, your contemporaries as well. So we'll just do some introductions. Um, I'll start on the screen. Uh, I'll call out some names. So Chris, you're next. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Rusin. I'm one of the senior directors at the Center for Medical Simulation. I'm an organizational psychologist by training and I'm part of the Department of Surgery at Mass General Hospital and uh, Harvard Medical School. Very excited to be with you. Maureen. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maureen Hemingway, and I am a nursing practice specialist for Periop at Mass General, and I'm happy to be in involved tonight. Jenny Rudolph, sorry, I was on mute. No problem. Hi, everybody. Um, I am a senior director at the Center for Medical Simulation also, which is a program that teaches teamwork and communication across the Harvard system. Uh, and I, like Chris, I'm an organizational behavior scholar by training and work with Denise and Maureen at Mass General from within the surgery department. So we're really excited to do this kind of different than a typical webinar where you're sitting and you're watching slides and you're listening to people drone on about a topic. Um, this is going to be super interactive. And this is a course that we put on uh, at Mass General in Boston multiple times a year with, um, with the faculty at our program. And we thought this would be a great venue to share it with all of you. So we have three residents that are um, working with us today. And I'm actually going to ask for about four, five other volunteers in the audience to come join us on stage. But I'll start out while you're thinking about whether or not you want to volunteer. I'm going to start out by inter uh, introducing, uh, having our panelists introduce themselves. So Jisoo, you're next on my screen. Hi, my name is Jisoo. I'm a PGY5 at Texas Tech University here in El Paso, training with Dr. Brian Davis. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to uh, be here. I'm doing a bariatric fellowship next year at East Carolina University. Welcome. Yes, John. Welcome. Hi, I'm John Marr. I'm also a PGY5 here at Texas Tech El Paso, uh, working with Brian Davis. Um, I am uh, actually applying right now for a bariatric fellowship. 
and you'll be able to see how incredibly awesome he is and how you should let him into your fellowship after this set, after this evening. <laughs> and um, Jonathan. Hi, my name is Jonathan Gavorkian. I'm one of PGY2 here at Texas Tech. I work with uh, Jisoo and uh, John as well. They're my chiefs and uh, Dr. D Brian Davis as well. So as you can all tell in the audience, Dr. Brian Davis um, did set us up with three uh, panelists. So we need five more. So I would either pick you guys or, oh, I got a hand. So once you raise your hand, we'll pop you up on the screen. So Ahmed Jendia, Vera, do you mind making him a panelist? This is almost like an auction. <laughs> once we get the five, we'll have you introduce yourselves. Come on in, folks. It's a lot more fun. It's going to be interactive, super low pressure, kind of fun. And it'll, it'll, it'll be much more interesting as part of the crew that's chatting. All right. If no one's raising their hands, I'm going to ask people to join us, okay? So I'll give one more opportunity for you to volunteer. All right, low stakes, but let's do, um, I'm sort of count off. So one, two, three, four. Berna. Vera, can we get Berna on? Does that work? That works. Okay. And then, uh, Let's see here. Yvette. Hi, Ahmed. Hi, Berna. Thank you. Hello. Sierra. Hey, Ahmed. Sorry, I'm just joined on the PC and the phone at the same time because the PC doesn't have a camera. My name no is worries. Ahmed. Um, Ahmed. I'm a general surgery registrar in Milwaukee Hospital in the UK, and I'm on call right now. Yeah, I was going to say, a bit late there, eh, Ahmed? Thanks yeah, it's still there. Um, let me get, uh, before I, I'm going to run to Bern in a second, but let's, can we get Yvette Sierra? Sierra, can you get someone on? Yeah, and I got another one that raised their hand. Okay. Wonderful. Um... Thank you, folks. There we go. I'm not sure what's happening to Yvette. I'm promoting her, but I'm not getting her. All right. Um, and then how about let's do Martha. How many have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We should be good. That should be good, right? Yeah, that sounds good. Martha, and then let's get, I didn't get someone towards the end, and Sushia. So while we're doing that, Berna, do you wanna introduce yourself? Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. very well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Berna. I'm a PGY2 slash three. I'm in my research year um, at University of Vermont Medical School or um, Medical Center. Um, and um, Chris and Jenny, I don't know if my name or face is familiar. Of course. Yes, I was like, <laughs> didn't weren't we just together? Yeah, I don't know. It was hard to forget. But, yeah, so you it's, got it's... Berna, I want you to know it was random. It was totally <laughs> random. Um, great. Welcome. And Mohammed. Hello, my name is Mohammed Kalantar. I'm an MD and PH. Uh, I'm currently a research fellow of bariatrics and uh, surgical education at Indiana University, working with Dr. Stephanidis. Oh, great. And Mohammed, by, by coincidence, Chris and I spent a couple of days with Dr. Stephanidis recently uh, in Orlando, I believe, at a research conference, if it's the same Stephanidis. 
Yes, uh, I was there. Uh, I was one of the uh, people who guided the uh, systematic reviews for the guide on development for simulations. Great. Okay. Well, I thought you looked a little familiar. Okay. Nice to see yeah, you again. Me too. I thought the same. Is All right. Would love to get, um, we're missing some people. So would love to get people, can we get one more, just to so balance it out a little bit, one more female, a female resident to balance up the panel. All right, shy bunch. No. Oh, there is. Right, here we go. Tamar. Hi there. Hi. Hey, Jessica. I am. Um, I'm a trauma and acute care surgery attending. Oh, love it! We would love to have an attending voice. I don't know if that, cool. that qualifies me to be on the <laughs> That's perfect. We love that. All right. And Tamar, is that how we? Yeah, I, I'm a colorectal surgery attending at Beverly Hospital on the North Shore. Yeah, I know your names look really familiar. Awesome. Um, okay, this is a great pan. I think we're good. If anybody wants to now join us, you're more than welcome to, but I think we have a great panel. Let's see. So we have one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people. That's what we're looking for. All right, let's get started. Um, so the first slide that you guys can see is become a Sages member. We Sages does a lot of these educational um, initiatives and is really built upon the energy and enthusiasm of our all of our members, um, but especially our kind of students, residents, fellows, et cetera. So um, it's a great crew. The meeting is happening in a couple of weeks in Montreal. It's not too late to get a couple of tickets to come out to Montreal. So please um, consider joining if you're not already a member. Um, Chris, do you mind advancing the slide? Oh, sure. So lots of benefits. I won't read through this. We're starting a little bit later. So you guys can, um, we can send you a copy of the slides, but a lot of this stuff you can find online, but lots of great opportunities, mentorship, research, et cetera. Um, the vision and values are here. So basically keep it in mind, um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, also to Viera, who's sending out a lot of the webinar invites. Vanessa Chung is also on here and we can definitely help get you in. These are the different categories of membership. So active or for attendings, candidate is for um, residents and fellows and then medical students. So we welcome everyone. And it's really, most people say it's the most fun organization that they're part of. So that's that. Next slide, please. All right. So we ask that you'll see um, the faculty on and then the ones who talk a lot, that's awesome. And when we open it up to the panelists, it'll be a lot more interactive. So um, we look forward to uh, everyone here is basically participating in video on, so that's great. Next slide, please. And so this is our Sages Raft webinar um, and it's entitled OR Teams Course Correction Workshop. Again, for those of you who may have joined late, um, this the crew of faculty that are um, mainly leading this myself. Um, we have a representative from ARIS who's not here today, um, Brianne. And our additional faculty are Chris Rusin, Jenny Rudolph, and Maureen Hemingway, whom you guys met earlier on. And we all represent different, we come from different backgrounds. So um, it makes the conversation really rich because we have different perspectives. And we're really excited to talk to some of our panelists today who also come with different um, experiences. So just sit back, relax, watch, listen to the conversation points. And if you have additional comments that are not being discussed on the by the panelists, feel free to drop in comments, questions, et cetera, and we're happy to answer them as we go along. So moving on, we have no relevant disclosures. All right, everybody. So here's the plan. Chris, you're up. Got it. Okay, folks, uh, welcome. So happy to be here with you. Let's make this interesting. Let's let's talk with each other and, and make it interactive, okay? So we've got a two-hour workshop, a little less than that now. 
uh, we're going to focus on course correcting a team after a difficult start. That's our focus for this workshop. All right, and that's our topic. So um, we'll cover what can happen to get a team off course. What are some of the different definitions and, and ways we talk about a team not starting well? Do we talk about it? We'll bring that up. And then what can we do to course correct our team? So to take it from not started well and uh, restart or, or get that team on the right track. That's what we'll be covering today. So, you know, if you've already started reflecting about some recent tricky starts, difficult starts, suboptimal starts in your teams, great, because we'll be talking about that tonight. Um, and this will be interactive, dynamic. We'll present you a bunch of concepts, but we'll be back and forth with you even as we do that. And um, we'll have two scenarios. They're not breakouts. They're, they're a scenario and then a discussion with our, with our group of participants here and then um, a second time. So we'll do two cycles of scenario and kind of debriefing and discussion. The idea is you leave this workshop with some personal strategies about things that you want to do differently. So we're hoping that you leave here with uh, really a personal experiment in mind, something that you will try, something that you will do differently tomorrow than you did today. Questions about the plan group? Feel free to stop me, ask me to repeat myself, clarify anything along the way. No worries about that. Maureen. Okay, thank you, Chris. So the OI has really um, evolved into a, a team uh, team activity. And with that can come some challenges sometimes when the teams come together. So we wanna try to describe some of those common challenges that we all probably expe uh, experience. But at the same time, as Chris was saying, we wanna come up with some personal strategies, not only for, for yourself on what you could do, but to strengthen that teamwork in the, in the OR and to help our patients uh, have a better outcome, particularly um, in relation to when, it, when, it, when a day or a case gets off to a little bit of a difficult start for whatever reason. Thanks, Maureen. Here's the basic schedule. We run it pretty tight, um, so we'll do our best to keep it moving along. Um, but again, please feel free to ask for clarification as we go. So concepts up front, then a scenario, some discussion, then another scenario and discussion. Before you know it, we'll all be running off to the rest of our labs. Jenny. So, folks, um, one of the things that Chris and I research in the OR as organizational psychologists is what are the things that actually help teams work the best together? And one of the things is assuming the best of each other, even when we make mistakes. And so one of the ways we tend to talk about that is how do we create a learning team together? And so tonight, even though this is a webinar, we're actually an ad hoc learning team that's come together, especially us faculty and the panelists who have so generously offered to work with us. And to make that work, one of the things we think that's helpful is to think this about each other, which is we believe that everyone participating here is intelligent, capable, cares about doing their best and wants to improve. And I don't know about you, but the first time I heard this, I thought that's really sweet. How, you know, how kumbaya-ish, seriously? You know, not everybody's like that but I've really come to see it as a discipline that I have to hold myself to because when you get triggered by something someone else does, trying to assume the best of them really helps you get in a good space where you can restart or reset. And so that's what we're gonna put out today. One of the things we'd like to ask also is, uh, although this uh, quartet of faculty has worked together many times before, we were always learning and we tend to make mistakes because we're always learning. So please hold the basic assumption about us if we get a word wrong or out of step for some reason and we'll try to restart our own selves. Thanks, Jenny. 
So we're going to do this, uh, play some scenarios that I think everybody will find um, really fun and pertinent to your day-to-day -day lives in the OR, and you'll know what I mean in a few minutes. Um, but out, what we talk about is kind of your leadership, your personal strategies of how to maintain the team environment in a positive way in the operating room, which we're all in day in and day out. Outside of the scope of this course will be kind of what your individual institution's administrative structure is. You know, if the OR is not running on time, we're talking about things that you can do to right the ship versus saying, well, the OR always has huge long turnovers and that automatically ruins the culture, et cetera. So we're just talking about things that we actually can control um, and things that we can do to change the kind of minute to minute culture within our own ORs. Thanks, Denise. So folks, online learning, you're probably used to it. I know Berna is. Um, it's surprisingly effective. It's shocking how, how good it can be. Um, and our, our organization has gotten really, really good at it. We, we um, have courses with folks around the world. Um, so it's, it can be great. Um, it can also be challenging. It's visually and cognitively kind of different and, and differently demanding than in-person learning. There is a temptation to multitask. We're really sensitive to all you folks who are kind of in webinar mode and who are not showing your video and not kind of directly talking with us. So um, we're gonna urge you to be with us to comment um, through the chat. That's Denise, that's possible, right? Folks can get in there through the chat. Yeah, yeah go ahead and lean in, lean on in folks. Um, anything you can do to engage with us, we're, we're really happy that you're here. And that is one of the challenges, you know, if you start to multitask, you're going to be kind of picking up a two dimensional version of the workshop. And we're hoping that you get the, the deeper experience. Chris, can I just clarify, we would love to hear from everybody. And unlike a usual webinar, um, unless you are on camera right now, the way to communicate with us is through the Q and A part of the chat. So please uh, chat, text us little comments or questions as cues and we will respond uh, either verbally or as A's. Thank you, Jenny. So how does this work? Why do we call it a workshop? How does it work? So we're going to be spending some time on concepts, but really a lot of time brainstorming. What, what should we say? What can we say? What can we do to improve these situations? We're going to exchange different ideas. So we're hoping that the group of panelists puts their ideas forward. Um, there's no right idea that will win the day here. And in fact, an exchange of ideas is really valuable for us. We might do a little bit of role playing. We'll certainly explore different behavioral options. Um, and again, hopefully you'll come away with a personal plan through that, through those steps of playing with concepts and playing with ideas. And we're building something. So it's a workshop. You didn't expect this. So first shock of the night, we have guest faculty and they're really famous. We, um, we secured Rihanna's participation before she was booked for the Super Bowl. So we got, you know, much better. Actually, she wasn't paid for the Super Bowl. So that joke doesn't even work. But anyway, these are our guest faculty. Um, we've got Van Halen, the rock band, now broken up. We've got Rihanna. And then we've got Bruce Spring, Spring, Springsteen, it's late, and the E Street Band. All right. And these are musical teams that we're going to learn from tonight and hopefully we'll have some fun with that so thank you guest faculty so and we also want to infuse at this moment some teaming wisdom from amy edmondson you may may, may or may not know amy she's kind of the person who popularized uh, psychological safety in teams as a topic and really developed that um, those ideas and a lot of the application of those ideas and has been an inspiration for people like me and jenny um and amy has introduced a concept or talks a lot about a concept called teaming and we want to give you some concepts from teaming jenny you want to set the stage for us a little bit yes so um i think it's really helpful to put this in the context um, of a really dramatic teaming situation that amy edmondson analyzed so some of you may remember approximately 10 years ago uh, some significant number of miners, maybe 20, were stuck way, way below ground under absolutely solid rock. 
um, with uh, dangerous gases gradually building up and no access to water, food, or anything else, and no way to get out of the mine because of a mine collapse. And teams poured in from all over the world to try to dig these men out. And the challenge was trying to figure out how to dig through hundreds of feet of solid rock with a drill that actually didn't exist yet. And so what Amy Edmondson looks at there is how do you get people who all have wildly different mental models of how to save the miners, come from completely different industries, speak different languages, and, and are all themselves in a very austere environment with very limited um, uh, comforts and ability to even do self-care very well. So in that um, setting, Chris, I hand over to you to highlight the things that Amy analyzed and figure out were most important. Great, thanks. So here are some concepts we'll, we'll use tonight related to teaming that were relevant for the miners and the rescuers and will be relevant for us tonight and also relevant for you and your ORs. Staying calm, so really being aware of emotions and controlling emotions such that you have access to your best thinking. Staying united, so making moves to unite the team together whatever those moves may be, um, supporting problem solving and supporting progress. So creating an environment for problem solving, creating an environment for progress that comes from being united and problem solving together and coordinating activity towards the goal within the team. All right, so those are some concepts that we'll be working with tonight. Let's, let's take some of those concepts to the next level. So you, how do we unify the team? Well, one great way to unify is to clarify what's happening in the team, um, emphasize shared goals, and clarify roles as we're um, making progress towards the goals. Initiating and inviting the sharing of ideas and concerns within your team with the assumption that it doesn't automatically happen. And we really know that it does not automatically happen. So it requires being initiated. It requires invitations. And then continuous clarifying amidst uncertainty. So as long as we have uncertainty, that means we have a demand for clarification. So what can we do to keep clarifying it in our teams? Open question. Some other tools, psychological safety. So creating environment, an environment in our team where people do not feel that they will be punished if they admit that they've made a mistake, if they admit that they don't know something, if they admit that they are confused or something else that might have a negative connotation to it in our, in our OR cultures. So how can we create a culture where people bring forward confusion rather than holding it in, bring forward the idea that they just made a mistake rather than holding it in? Situational humility, which is the idea that even though we know a lot about our teams, even though we know a lot about our team situations, there's plenty that we don't know. Um, and there's all, we'll, we will always be surprised at the things that we don't know. So we need to maintain, going to the last bullet, curiosity and have in mind, um, how can I find out what it is that I don't know? How can we share with one another what it is that we don't know about the situation? So bringing curiosity as opposed to certainty to our teamwork. How do those sound and any questions or clarifications needed? Because that was a fair amount of like conceptual download for you guys. Panelists, how you doing with these? See some nods, Chris, thumbs up. I saw John nodding. He might be faking it though. <laughs> All right, Chris, I think we can rock and roll. Yeah, good. let's rock. Um, so prior to the rock and roll, ooh, I didn't mean to do that, push the wrong button. Um, prior to the rock and roll, um, bad starts to teamwork do happen and you're going to see some um, different little snippets um, potentially of that occurring. We all have a lot of things going on daily in our um, in our work worlds and our you know non-work worlds. And so there's production pressure, demands, things that you're thinking about from home, a conversation you had with a colleague, a bad patient outcome. So all these things are in our minds. Um, I think that it's ever, you know, in these constant um, different pressures to be able to keep everybody on course, 
keep everybody working to the top of their ability in a positive manner is really hard. And a lot of times as surgeons, we're the ones who are uh, responsible for making sure that that environment um, uh, is positive. And, and I think it's a privilege. And so these, there's multiple reasons why bad starts can happen. They're listed here, human error, different emotions, incomplete understanding. Somebody says one thing, and another person gets really defensive, but they were actually meaning it in a totally altruistic way. So all of these, we get it, it occurs, um, it's human nature, it's human life, uh, but how do we find strategies that will get everybody back on the same page, working in the same direction, and ultimately um, doing the safest thing for patients? That's the goal of today's course. Thanks, Denise. So how do we handle our bad starts? Um, they happen, they happen all the time for lots of different reasons, how do we handle them? Here's an example from basketball. Let's just look at this for a minute. So this is a story about a team that goes out on the court and gets down six points immediately after just one minute of play. And the coach takes a very precious resource and calls a timeout just after one minute, brings everybody back, essentially restarts the game for that team. Um, and then the team goes back out onto the court has a 12 to nothing run of their own ends up winning the game never never trails again it's just a great you know it's not a it's not a crazy story or anything like that but it's just a great story of a team that resets itself after a bad start interesting thing about basketball teams and jenny was a collegiate basketball player and a pretty capable point guard from what i understand um basketball teams have head coaches we don't have those in the OR. Interesting thing. So that actually puts it to the team to be noticing these things for itself and taking action for itself. Now let's rock and roll to Denise's point. All right. So we're going to look at um, three music teams doing their thing. And these are three very, very, very high end, very high performing music teams. Okay. And they happen to come from the popular music world, rock music world from a few different genres and generations. Um, this first video here is going to be a very famous rock band, a slightly hard rock band, Van Halen. And what's happening here in this video is that they're playing in a giant stadium and they're about to play their most popular song ever. It was a song called Jump. And yeah, I see you, Jonathan, you can jump if you want to. But you're going to have trouble jumping to this version of it because what happens is the very famous keyboard introduction starts and then when the guitar comes in they're clearly in two different keys meaning they're out of tune with one another in a very bad way so i want you all to know if you're not a fan of rock music and you just say it all just sounds like noise this really didn't sound good to the band and didn't sound good to the audience okay we just want you to know that and let's 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 watch van halen play a little bit And what happened was the band played the entire song that way. They never, they never stopped. They played the whole song that way. And it became a real curiosity. It became a little bit of a phenomenon. And a number of articles were written about the fact that they just went ahead and played the entire song completely out of tune. Um, and lots of people were trying to guess what had happened. Was it a technology issue? Was it a problem with a pre-recorded track? Was the guitar in a different key than it normally is? Um, but Van Halen played all the way through that song, even though they had an obvious problem. So what we want to do is stop right here. And panelists, want to get your thoughts about what do you think happened there? Why would they play that song all the way through? 
Am I off mute? Uh, the they might not have. Oh, go ahead. No, you, please. Oh, I was going to say, you know, they might not have known they had a problem at the time. Although they even off key sound better than I ever could. <laughs> yeah, John, it's possible. Although I, I believe they did know that they had a problem. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's it happens sometimes in teams that we don't know that we have a problem, but I think this team knew. Mohammed. Um, so I think they they realized it, but um, the cost of stopping and turning back and trying to correct things was much more than just keep going and just take the loss for <laughs> undesirable sounds. Okay, Mohammed. So there are costs of restarting. Um, these guys might even set off like fireworks that line up with some of the lyrics and things like that. <laughs> Puts a lot of pressure on it. Um, okay, thank you. Berna. And by cost, I mean uh, both the, uh, uh, the financial and just the value of um, the work. Okay. Mohammed, just, just to clarify, we mentioned clarifying before. That second part that you brought up, what are those costs? What, why would it be better to continue on versus stopping? And actually, not just to Muhammad, but to everybody. I think just the probability and the risk they take uh, to evaluate uh, how much they can fix. Is it possible? Is it feasible? And if they, uh, because it's a possibility they couldn't fix it at all. So I think they just thought it, it is um, more convenient just to keep going, although it's not perfect. Thanks, Mohammed. Verna. Yeah, they may not have had a predetermined or um, a, like pre-agreed upon signal or cue to communicate with one another. You know, it may be that one person's like thinking in their head, like the singer might think something doesn't sound right. I'm not quite sure. Don't know how to communicate that. And I don't want to ruin things by stopping the show. And then, you know, the guitarist might be thinking the same thing. But they might not have a signal or a way to communicate that. Okay, thanks. So teams usually work that out ahead of time. I know I've, I've witnessed many, many, many surgical timeouts um and briefings and sometimes i see teams spend a lot of time on contingency planning if the if the table sets on fire here's what we do and you've got the saline right there and you've got a number of steps that you take and i've actually seen teams not do any of that at all um so interesting thought Verna, that that they may not have planned for those contingencies other thoughts so uh chris i wanted to read um Tamar um, wrote, the show must go on. When you miss a dance move, you just keep on going or miss a line in a play. I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then I'll, I'll read some of the Q&A and we ask our audience. To, we'll read off the Q&As that are written already. But if anybody else has thoughts, please also jump in. Oh, I just think from a risk benefit analysis, you say, can we make this work? In general, you say, what's, uh, what's a deal breaker versus what can you work through? So perhaps at that moment they said, as you commented, um, Chris, that you Van Allen still in, singing is out of key is still probably better than the average person. Yeah, thanks, Tamar. Um, Sushia wrote, "No one made the decision to stop. No coach." And Amer um, said, "Stopping still provides some enjoyment to the audience versus stopping completely, partial success, basically." Okay. Wow. Okay. We are warming up and I'm loving that. We're, we're using these rock bands as a way to warm up before we start talking about our healthcare teams. And this is going great. Rihanna is an amazing performer, incredibly accomplished and has led many different teams because Rihanna um, has had several different bands throughout her career. All right. So here's an example of Rihanna performing with one of her bands on one of her um, fairly recent tours. Several years ago, though. Oh, folks, there's going to be some language here that, you know, my children might get slightly in trouble for if they used it. <laughs> okay.
and shit. What the fuck is that? Why is the track off from the band? This is the bullshit we deal with when we just doing a random rock and roll tour, all right? With no rehearsals and shit. I apologize for everybody at home streaming live on Love Life and Jay-Z site, Life and Times. We can start this one again from the top. All right, and then the band had a perfect performance with their next try. Panelists, what do you think of that team? That's Rihanna. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, you know, give me a little bit more. So what, what are some of the features of Rihanna's style or leadership there? So she's obviously a very confident individual and she's a, a master at her craft and she knows what she can fix and she's the leader of that uh, whole group. So she recognized something was off and she's like, this is low quality. And she stopped it and she's like, let's reset, let's start over. I mean, I, I think her language and everything is just like her style and her personality to make it kind of like, uh, you know, make it a little bit more playful, but um, she knew what she was doing and she corrected it very well. Thanks, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Panelists, other thoughts? Let's keep building. I think she was also speaking to her uh, entire team, like the behind the scene team, by basically saying we can do better. And she talked about, you know, this is what happens when we don't rehearse and et cetera. You know, um, I think that she wants to, she wanted to bring out the fact that, you know, there was a lack of preparation, you know, that was not up to her standard. Okay. And this can kind of like, you know, translate it to the way that we work as well. Thanks, Jisoo. Now, at this moment, we often hear comments about the impact, the possible impact on the team. We don't see the team here because they're actually in darkness on the stage. They're not featured um, and the camera is not on them as well. But what might the impact on the team be with the way that Rihanna course corrected this team? We can only guess, but what might it be? I think it's almost like she's accusing them of it being their fault and that she has no part in it. So it, she, she might it, have no part in it, but I think it's it comes to uh, perhaps a question of professionalism. So the way that she handles herself versus the way that Van Halen handled himself, maybe I'm an old lady here, but uh, they handled themselves in different uh, manners, um, but they're also uh, have different audiences. So uh, if that works for her team, then perhaps that's a great way to handle it. Uh, so that's sort of professionalism is what I think of when I hear that. Thanks, Tamar. Jonathan. Uh, I completely agree. But at the same time, we have to remember it's uh, she's the face that's performing. So if something goes wrong, they say Rihanna messed up or whatever. So likewise, drawing a parallel to the OR. Um, you know, if the tech or so on messes up or messes up or has a bad day, you know, it's ultimately the surgeon's going to be put at fault. So um, I feel like, you know, in this instance, you know, like recognizing the mistake, starting over and correcting to have a good outcome makes it look, you know, there's only one face that's going to be present in front of family at the end of the day. So. Rihanna's taking the blame for anything bad and sword surgeons. So that's my opinion. Chris, we have a, a number of comments in the uh, chat. If you'd like me to relay them to you or you- Please, Jen, yeah, if you could do some highlights for us, that'd be great. Sure. So um, there is a comment from a mayor uh, concerned about, um, you know, causing the audience to possibly pile on to her band and feel critiques of her band. And similarly, um, uh, somebody was worried about them embarrassing the team in front of the audience. And so turning up the heat was okay, but maybe embarrass the team. Um, Jay Raiden, I wanna toss this one to you, Denise. He, uh, I think it's, he says, surgeons were expected to be perfect every time. We don't go into an operation telling the patient, I'm gonna try my best. 
We're expected to be perfect every time, not just try. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the other surgeons on this call and in this webinar would agree that you're kind of, it's similar to Rihanna, you're the face of the OR, right? Something doesn't go well, something, you know, um, doesn't go smoothly or a poor patient outcome. It ultimately falls on, or many times it feels like it falls on the surgeon. And so that's something that you, um, you take on that, that, you know, you have to think about when you're actually in charge of how the environment of the OR is running. It's a, it's a big responsibility. And so that plays into how you react to a lot of these um, circumstances and having to think twice a little bit about it is a huge responsibility, but what's the best way to interact with your team so that you're not embarrassing them. It's not backfiring and everybody's still working at their best and not discouraged. Okay. Thanks everybody. I just want to point out, this is going very well. We're warming up and we're starting to bring up lots of different dynamics that happen in our teams. We're starting to relate this to our OR teams. That's happening automatically and naturally. And we're starting to bring up some things that are difficult. <laughs> and that's good because we're trying to have a really fruitful and productive workshop here and it's not a simple environment. So the surgeon has a role, surgeon has visibility, sense of responsibility, a professional identity associated with the wellness of that patient, the outcomes, patient outcomes, most likely to communicate with the family. And we have an entire team there in the OR. We're concerned about the performance of that team, how well that team works together. We're concerned about the sustainability of that team, the psychological well-being of that team. Um, can that team perform well in the next case and two cases after that? Can that team perform well tomorrow and next week and next month? These are all factors and they all, we, we have to um, handle them all at once. And we're starting to, to hold those and be aware of those. So nice job. Thank you, Rihanna. Here's Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band making that one mistake, but several. Talk to me about that team. Talk to us about that team. So he basically, I think, did the same thing that Rihanna did, but in a very uh, intuitive way, not to hurt any feelings, I guess. Uh, from his own team, uh, being, I mean, taking the lead on correcting the fault at the same time um, not insulting anyone or blaming others versus himself okay so another example of a team that did reset their performance in this case it was the leader making the mistake several in a row but we saw the team behave differently other thoughts about specifics there or what this brings up in you yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Um, he definitely saw there was a problem, but, uh, you know, he stopped it and kind of just reset everything, kind of laughed about it, made a joke, and was like, you know, let's let's start over and do this the right way. Chris, um, we had a comment the previous time, which we didn't get to from uh, Nena, uh, who made the point with Rihanna that they might not have had adequate rehearsal, and then there's the cost of starting over. And what I thought was cool about this one, based on what everybody's saying here, is 
they somehow did it with humor and self-deprecation, you know, sort of making fun of his own self. And I, I feel like I'd love to hear what you think, Nana, but that it sort of diminished the cost in a way. It, it almost, in, I don't know, it might have even enhanced the performance. Yeah, it's such a great point. Um, I'm actually a rock musician. I'm an, I'm an old one now, but um, I used to perform quite a bit. And when my band was performing a lot, we almost never made mistakes. And um, when we started to rehearse less, we made more mistakes. And me being a teamwork scientist, <laughs> I actually would reset our songs. And it wouldn't happen often, let's say one song per performance. That's, that seems like a lot though. Um, but to me, actually, th there was a cost associated with not stopping. So there's a, there is a cost associated with stopping that we've explored and there's a cost associated with not stopping. And that's true in music and probably true in the OR as well. We can explore that together today. Um, but the cost in music is that you play a terrible performance for your audience. Something that sounds dissonant as opposed to beautiful. And um, something that sounds slightly off kilter or has a dissonant element to it as opposed to being you know, harmonious. And um, so let's keep in mind those costs as we, as we keep going here. Lovely warm up, everybody. And panelists, thank you. And you're doing great. Okay, so just to refresh the learning objectives that Maureen um, walked us through earlier, this is what we're here for. And again, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of hard work as we try to hold multiple concepts at once. The idea is to come out with personal strategies. Again, specifically to unify your team, to clarify, to strengthen outcomes. And those outcomes being patient outcomes as well as um, psychological outcomes for the team that I think are really featured in our society right now and in our, in our healthcare world. Okay, so we are going to have some scenarios from our industry, okay? So what we'll do is we'll have, um, we'll watch a, an animated video that's a real, it's inspired by real events. And this was built by your peers. This was built by OR nurses, anesthesiologists, and surgeons. All right, and then we'll stop the scenario and Jenny and Denise will lead us through a discussion and debriefing of the first scenario. And then we'll have another cycle. Here we go. The OR has four cases today, scheduled to last until 2.30 p.m. The surgeon has a case on the wait list that needs to be done this afternoon before a week-long vacation. The staff administrator has already informed the surgeon that all cases need to be finished in the OR by 5 p.m. The anesthesia attending needs to speak in an important meeting at 5.30 p.m. across town, and the OR nurse has child care issues at 5. You are the surgeon, anesthesia providers, and nursing team in this OR for the day. You've worked together in the past, but not recently. It's currently 7.30 a.m. in the OR. The surgeon has just called into the room and the huddle has been performed with the entire team. All concerns have been addressed. The anesthesia resident is getting ready to transport the patient into the OR. The anesthesia attending is ready to assist the resident in preparing the patient to go to sleep. Hi, I'm going to go get the patient and bring them in. Are you ready? Yep. Do you need me to go with you? If so, I just need a few minutes to finish this con. Um, will you come and help with transport? Uh, sure. I'll meet you over there. Just let me notify my attending. Okay. Perfect. Meet me in white periop. It's, it's bay 18. Hi there. Uh, we're getting ready to bring the patient to the OR. Uh, paperwork is all set and it looks like everything else is ready to go. Great. I'll be right down. Uh, by the way, I have a case on the wait list that I need to do today. So uh, anything we can do to help expedite the day will really help. Thanks. The patient is in the OR now. The nursing team has just completed their pre-surgical checklist when they noticed that one of the instruments was not processed properly and is considered unsterile. We have a contaminated instrument. I need to get my SLC and get this case repicked. How long will that take? Um, we're going to need about 30 minutes. Looks like we're going to have a little bit of a delay. Everything's fine, uh, but let me give you some medicine to help you relax. It's now 9.20 a.m. The OR has been successfully set up. The patient is anesthetized, intubated, prepped, and draped. The OR is close to two hours behind schedule. It's estimated that the waitlist case will not start until at least 4 p.m., making it potentially challenging to end by 5. 
Everyone ready for a timeout? Uh, seriously, people, do you think we can ever get this case going? Oh my goodness, does this person know how hard I have worked all morning to get this case going? It is so much easier to keep everyone happy than it is to get back to calmness. This is going to be a long day. I just don't understand why this couldn't have been caught earlier. Shouldn't the count be done way in advance of 7.45 a.m. so we can avoid situations like this? And then we keep adding more and more of these useless checklists that waste time. First the huddle, now the timeout, later the debrief. This patient needs an operation done by a safe surgeon. All the other stuff is a complete waste of time. Oh, all right, deep breath, let me focus. The OR always needs to run by the surgeon's schedule, and when it's not done perfectly, I get a whole lot of attitude. But when the surgeon's late to the OR because they had to see a patient clinic, or a case took longer than usual, or the med student is going to close the skin, suddenly it's all okay, and the rest of us just have to wait around. That's not good patient care. That's just being selfish. Okay, team. Um, let me just refresh that we're going to be kind of a learning team together and uh, really welcome your thoughts. Um, uh, Denise, Maureen, and I, who will be chatting with you, uh, you know, really um, are able to lean in and build up ideas uh, the more that we hear from you. So feel free to chime in. There's no one right answer or anything like that. I'm going to um, share my screen with you just for a second, and then I'll just sort of go back to chatting, but I wanna give you an idea of the uh, structure that will follow over the next few minutes. So first I'm gonna start with some reactions from you uh, about you know, what you just heard. Then um, we're gonna talk a bit about outcomes uh, influenced by this kind of interaction. Um, and we're gonna talk maybe a little bit about the outcomes on the patient perhaps outcomes on the providers themselves, the clinicians, and then outcomes on the team. And then we're gonna pivot from those insights and let's think together a little bit about what moves you would use maybe to course correct this team. You know, um, We saw some moves by Rihanna, we saw some moves by Van Halen, we saw some moves by um, uh, Bruce Springsteen. What moves might we, what might you suggest we use or what moves would you use to reset that team? So let me start with some reactions from all of you. What goes through your head when you hear that or see that? Jen, Jenny, do you mind if I make one clarification before we get started? Please, Maureen, that'd be great. Okay, so so usually we're doing this course with, um, with, the, with teams. Uh, we have surgical techs in the room. Um, the nurses are there, the anesthesia providers, and the surgeons are there. So we're sort of getting everybody's perspective, and I'm 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 just getting a little nervous sitting here thinking that um, that you're all surgeons, but um, I'm I'm sure that you'll remember that there's there's a, a whole other team of people behind you um, uh, who also have um, an investment in these patients. Thanks, Maureen. I, mean, I think that's a great point. So I think as we have this discussion, um, I think it'd be critical for if there's any counter, you know, kind of other perspectives to consider to, to bring those up. Cause I think that'll be great for the overall conversation. Okay, thanks Denise. So initial reactions, what goes through your head when you hear a team like that? I mean, uh, everyone has a good point. I mean, everyone has something that uh, concerns them and they all have good points like the anesthesiologist saying oh we're slowing down for the medical student <laughs> like i mean we, we all know that's true but at the same time it's it's like you know if someone wanted the cases to go at a certain pace then maybe they should contribute in a certain way like offer what like my more solutions than just complaints i, I think that would be one way to go about it Okay, thanks Jonathan for getting us going. So everybody has their own good points, things they need to get done. There's complaints, there's solutions, other reactions. I think we saw um, in the last musical example, how the leader really sets the tone for the team. So he still acknowledges in that example, what is going on and what's happening. Like he 
verbalizes that he forgot how the song goes. Similarly, Rihanna, she doesn't necessarily set a similar tone as he does, but she also mentions, as opposed to saying like, you know, we really need like making a joke and saying we really need to practice more or rehearse more. She says like, why like my band didn't rehearse or kind of is a little bit more blamey. But I think something that I would incorporate or apply to this scenario is, you know, like I think the surgeon comments that were made were out loud, not like not a thought. I think as part of the timeout, she was a little bit negative or very negative. Um, so I think you know adjusting that and setting a more neutral slash positive tone, but also addressing you know like what are we gonna you know take away or debrief from this so we can do better, and let's you know still get through today. Okay, great. Thank you, Berna. So. Um, Berna, you're sort of sharing a reaction or a thought about the tone setting of how people respond and what that does for the immediate case and what that does for the rest of the day. Um, let's pivot and let's talk a little bit uh, about the outcomes influenced by this. What, if you were in that OR, what impacts would you be worried about um, or what impacts would you be thinking about on the patient, on yourself, or on the team? With the reaction by the attending, a lot of times it can create some tension in the room. And you, more often what that leads to is like, let's say when someone sees something wrong, it makes them a little more afraid to bring up another mistake that could be happening just because of the tension that's already created. Great. So Denise, by the way, feel please go, chime in here as we go. So I'm hearing from Jisoo that, you know, when the attending creates some tension, then downstream that might make it even less likely for other people to bring things up. So that, you know, brings up the concept of um, psychological safety, right? And so people you know, there's a lot of literature on this, but it's how do you create an environment where you can invite others to speak up and not fear expressing concerns and, and whatnot. I just came off a meeting before this webinar where we're talking about universal protocol. And, you know, if despite the timeout and everything, they all agreed they were going to do something on the right side. And then when the time actually came, it was done on the left side. And so there are no faults to the universal protocol. Everything was done correctly. But why did it still happen on the left side? So one of the things that came up was, you know, the, it, that the attending went ahead and started doing this and maybe people didn't feel comfortable speaking up. So I think that's, you know, what, what are the outcomes that can be affected? Well, it's, you know, you, you bring up great points, you know, how, how residents and trainees and other members of the team feel, um, how it affects patient outcomes in the end, right? Thank you, Denise. Other thoughts about uh, how this might land on you if you were in there, how thoughts you might have about the patient, thoughts and for the team. Yeah, I mean, um, I think just like what everyone else said, I mean, the starting the tone, um, you know, in the video, you could see, I guess, the thoughts of other, other team members as well. Um, and it was more of like a blame game. Everyone was blaming everyone else. Um, and I think a lot of times if you focus on that, you're going to you know, miss the opportunity to like fix the problem uh, to get back on track. Um, Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, I think we or Denise or Maureen, we have a couple comments in the q and I don't know if they're for this, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, before you, Jessica and um, Tamara probably have comments also that came off mute. Right, right. I, I think. What I kind of took away from this was everyone saying the tone was bad, but the intent was good. And, um, you know, the day started out with the team putting the patient's safety at the first, like at the center of it, that there was a contaminated instrument that they weren't going to use for the procedure. And so everyone that was a part of the team that was going to be taking care of the patient decided that the time cost of sterilizing that instrument to take care of the patient um, to make sure that they had proper equipment was respected. 
And I think everyone else kind of internalized what the time cost was for them. So as frustrated as they are, I think the team was acting in the patient's best interest for them to have the best outcome. And I'm sure there are times when people don't bring up breaches and contamination because they know the reaction of the whole room is going to be what it was. And I think that that's something that we should not discount in this team's um, performance. It's a great point. That's so beautiful. And Jessica, I think that tension between um, patient safety, quality, or sometimes even staff wellness and production pressure is so real. And I love how you uh, unpack that. Uh, Denise, you said someone else had a thought? Tamar. Tamar, hi. Oh, I was, I was essentially going to kind of bring up the point of systems approaches and um, trying to figure out where when there's um, a system breakdown versus um, a person made a mistake kind of it, it doesn't it doesn't help to place blame at that moment but to say okay as a system how can we do better but what what are we going to do to move things forward and um, going back to the whole thing, the surgeon always sets a tone. And um, in general, and, and I'm sure that the attendings can stay for this, and I think most residents can stay for this as well, that um, if you are a pleasure to work with, your team will work harder for you. So you really, it's it's one of those um, things you have to learn now and keep with you forever, but they will move mountains for you if you um, stay positive and you are a team player and whatever you can help with, you will do. Um, so I think that's a that's a very key thing to uh, move forward from this. Thank you, Tamar. Maureen, do you mind helping us with the Q&A? Sure. Um, so Jay tells us that there are several motivators for an efficient team. Incentive, if a team was paid for a full day and finished by two, I'm sure the turnover would happen faster. Uh, number two, integrity. A team should want to be efficient and proud of doing a good job. Three, support of each team member would be very helpful and crew resource management, which we do talk about a lot, um, as in the um, industry, airline industry. And, uh, and then Sushela, the surgeon should engage the entire team before making decisions. Mm, okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so we're gonna pivot to now, part of our goal with this session was introducing these um, sort of real world challenges via the audio and animation, but then coming up with some moves that um, you all could use in the OR yourselves when you go back. So let me just uh, flash my screen for a moment and I'm gonna put these down here so they might be a little stickier, even though that means we can see each other a little bit less. Uh, bear with me for one second. By stickier, I mean easier to remember because you're seeing them and saying them. So what are the moves that we might, you might suggest or you might do um, to reset a team like this? And I've caught a couple things you've already said. As you can see, uh, you're setting the tone. Rihanna did not set a supportive tone and throws pe threw people under the bus. So we wanna wanna do the opposite maybe, um, using a neutral tone, somebody said. And then um, Tamar, you gave us the general principle of if you're a pleasure to work with, people wanna work with you. But if we could be more specific even, what kind of what phrases or what might you say here if you were you know, the attending or you're your own PGY X self, to try to help the team reset and get off to a better start. We can kind of build this up together. Yeah, Jenny, okay. if I were to challenge my friend, Berna. Yeah. Um, so Berna, you pointed out that um, setting the tone is a thing and it can be done in various ways. Might you take one little step further and say setting the tone is a job to do? Like we are always setting the tone, so we should set the tone um, and do that on purpose. Is that fair to say? Or am I hearing that in what you were saying? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think that that would be fair to say. I think that, um, you know, like identifying, even if you identify the reason immediately after it's happened, assuming it's not something that you would need to do 
like a debrief for RCA to like kind of investigate further to uncover any systems issues or what exactly happened. Um, you can offer some kind of frame for everyone to at least feel heard or just acknowledge people's frustrations or even offer an opportunity for people, you know, just to clear the air, like even saying something as simple as, I. I think a lot of people are frustrated or something like that, just like naming it. Um, I think people usually feel a little bit better when they feel like even if that doesn't solve everyone's problem. Um, Erno, your mic got a little behind your ear or something. We lost you there for that. Um, in a nutshell, I was just saying that um, giving people the opportunity to, or giving, yeah, giving your team the opportunity to clear the air um, and kind of Put a name to that they feel heard. I think can make a big difference. And yes, that's absolutely I agree with you. Um, that setting the tone is a job. So, Berna, your mic is actually going in and out. Um, but we've captured a few of the really great <laughs> things you're putting forth. And let's just go to go back to the panel. What are some other ideas to build on what Berna is saying? So if this is a job that you need to do, and those are some of the moves you can make, what are some other moves that you might make? I, I think uh, just providing verbal uh, support as of appreciating everything that each member of the team is doing, because the thought processes in the video was like, uh, they know they have to do this job, and they're doing whatever they're doing, but they're just not happy that, I mean, their efforts has not been, um, I mean, appreciated much. So I think just providing that support verbally at least uh, is very important. And then as Berna said, to um, ask them to, I mean, talk if they have any thoughts and, uh, um, the lead the surgeon as a leader of the team can provide anything else. Just talking about it, I think that kind of provides a good atmosphere for unifying the thought process of the team and then uh, getting back to work. I think so. This is sort of a unique example because it was nobody's nobody's specific fault that this happened. It's just bad luck. And um, I'm not sure what the team was doing in the time that they were waiting for the equipment, but uh, I find sometimes when you have that extra time, just sort of using that time to get the team organized for the rest of the day so that nobody feels like their time is truly being wasted. And uh, you probably could shave off some of that time, you know, what equipment you might need or specific plans that you have for uh, some of the other pieces in the day that you could just shift that time around. Um, I do that a lot in my job because what we do is very unpredictable. So just being a little bit more creative about what you're doing in this time that you think you're just waiting instead of focusing on, oh, we're wasting so much time. I, I, I'm, since we have, I have a captive audience here of, of surgeons, I know as a nurse in the room, I would be really aggravated and, and frustrated at this whole, at this whole thing. And I know that, that they, me and them are doing a lot of work and it, and it takes a little bit to like reset yourself, to get yourself back to where you need to be, you know, calm and, and cooperative and, and getting along with everybody. And I know what I need to do, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering what, what surgeons do to, to, to reset themselves in such situations you know your day is is going to hell in a handbasket and maureen you mean the personal emotional reset right well i think it depends on the person so the ones so as a as an attending i would say if i had other things to do that i could catch up on and that helped me then i would go do that if i really have nothing else to do and or 
like I said, I think I can get to that add on or whatever, and I can help open and help give things to help your job um, opening things. And, and I'd love to do that. And I turn to my nurses and say, or the OR tech, what else can I get you? Anything else you think that you need? Go ahead and open, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think it's individual. So what, what works for people? Being aware of your own, um, what works for you and what doesn't work for you and for in your team, knowing your team. That's, uh, as you said, Maureen, kind of understanding the dynamics of your team. Because I know some of my anesthesiologists don't want help with a nurse anesthetist um, and others definitely enjoy it, so. Different people. Mm. But I love this conversation because, you know, all the things that Jenny's putting on this screen column on the, um, on the screen, everybody has a different style. Um, everybody has a different personality. And so there's a bunch of different ways, right, that you could probably diffuse the situation, so to speak, and kind of right the ship. Uh, we talked a little bit about different role groups, so surgeons, anesthesiologists, nursing, and, and, and the amount of um, the individual different responses that may come with that. I'm curious, we do this often with um, all attendings um, back, you know, when we run this course, but we have a mixed group here, and I've always been curious from the residents that are on this call and as you represent, you know, everyone who's sitting in the audience as well, if the day is not going well, you're attending, you're working with your attending all day, it's supposed to go really smoothly. They're, they, you know, it starts out great and then this happens. And what I love about the scenario is that everybody who listens to this, no one can say, oh, this never happens because it like literally happens five times a week. So when this happens and your attending's frustrated and you're kind of just trying to pick up the pieces and anesthesia is frustrated the attending and there's just that little bit of the air is just not perfect in that room. Mm -hmm. Anything you guys could do as residents mm -hmm. or what do you do? How do you deal with that situation? Great question. I won't tell Brian for those of you who <laughs> I think like all of us in our head uh, would think, okay, well, it's one of those days again, you know, and I'm sure everybody had that. And um, I think the way to approach it, like, you know, it depends on the situation as well. And like you know, some attendings will be upfront with you and say, hey, I have a 12 o'clock meeting that, you know, I've got to get to or, or, or whatnot. Or, you know, sometimes I might just say, hey, like, I can call you when things are ready, you know, if there's a delay and such. Um, uh, I think in the end, though, you do want to keep the team together. And the, the, one of the ways to, you know, do that is by just saying, hey, thanks for bringing this up. Things happen. Let's just make sure the rest of the day was more efficient, you know. Um, and more often than not, as a resident, when we speak up like that, you know, attending will follow through also. You know, they'll come to like the realization that, hey, you know what, yeah, things happen. It's fine. We can move forward. A lot yeah, of, I think also. Uh, go ahead, John. No, I was just gonna say I, I've worked with uh, John and Jisoo a lot, and they've. I don't know if they even realize it, but they've shown me a lot in terms of like their things that you don't really write down and teach. It's just like the way they carry themselves. Um, like if the attendings not in the room, like. They're having like a light conversation with the team, especially like after like a really stressful like turn of events or like uh, just constantly calling saying, hey, um, do you guys have the consent? Is everything ready? Is there anything I could do? Like these little kind of steps actually go a long way. And I think uh, my two chiefs, like they're the ones that really have like kind of found their way in terms of like working around all these uncomfortable situations like their own styles of like kind of diffusing the situation. Yeah, and, and I think that's like the main thing. I mean, when you're in a situation where there's really not a lot you can do, just ask what you can do. You know, you can ask your team, hey, what can I do to help? Anything that I can help do to make things go faster. Um, and then it's also just knowing your team. You know, there's certain people we all know, you give them a little bit of a nudge to try to pressure them, they're gonna go slower. And then there's other people you can give a healthy nudge to, and then they understand, oh, okay, we need to get going, let's go faster. So I think you need to really understand the team that you're working with. Uh, you need to know how people respond to certain criticisms versus, you know, resting versus not resting, and then just help out, honestly. I mean, that's the only thing you can do. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, um, but. 
Yeah, I guess I would just add, you know, as I'm hearing all of your comments, and I really love this dynamic of, you know, attendings and residents and hearing this, but and with the resident audience, because I, I, as I'm thinking about it, I actually think you guys play a pivotal role, right? And so where you are right now and seeing this and seeing something like this unfold, not only can you keep the, you bridge the gap kind of if there's any friction between an attending and an, an anesthesia attending a resident or an attending and the scrub tech and whatnot. So, you know, you are, you can play that middle ground. I think the other thing just from a mentorship way is a uh, 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 angle is, you know, these things happen all the time, as we all know, but where you guys right are right now is, is great where you take it all in and you're watching all of this happening and you can learn a lot, right. By, kind of what Jonathan's saying by the modeling that's going on. And so there are certain attendings who do this very well. They never, they, you know, they know how to diffuse the situation even when it gets stressful and whatnot. And you learn from those, just like when you're operating, who has, you know, a really slick move that you want to make sure you incorporate that in practice. Um, and then there are other attendings who just really don't, right? And so it's always kind of really chaotic or really stressful. And so I think you guys are in a great spot also by just watching and, and observing and learning good, good habits and skills. Great. Well, thank you, um, team, for your thoughts on the reactions, the outcomes, and the moves we could make. And uh, we're going to pivot now and look at a different sort of challenge. So, Chris, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Jenny. All right, this, this next scenario is it's about one of my favorite topics, which is sub teams within the team. So let's get on in there. A surgical procedure is just beginning. In the OR, our surgeon, surgical resident, attending anesthesiologist, new surgical technologist, and an experienced circulator. The patient is anesthetized, intubated, prepped, and draped. The surgeon is ready for the timeout. The anesthesiologist is reviewing the documentation, and the circulator is teaching the new surgical technologist how to prepare an instrument. All right, guys, You're are we ready for a timeout? Disposable cartridge and insert it into the instrument. Nope, the other way around. Uh, are we ready is for a timeout? No, nope, not yet. I want you to turn that piece the other way and then push it into the instrument. Can we get started now, guys? Like this? Um, just give me one second. No, no, turn it 180 degrees. Guys, I'm really not going to use that till much later in the case. Can we please just focus for a second and get going with this case? I know I should be paying attention to the surgeon and getting the timeout going, but this is a really fast case. And if this scrub doesn't get this piece on correctly, it is going to disrupt getting the next patient over and getting my documentation done. Why do I always happen to get the scrub student? And why don't they train them before they actually get into the OR? Everyone is supposed to stop and pay attention during the timeout. This is a perfect example of how distractions get in the way. The case has progressed and the surgeon's cell phone rings. It's their office. The nurse answers the phone. This is your office about one of your patients. Can I put it on speaker? Oh, wait, wait, no, no, no. It um, actually concerns someone who works here. Could you please bring the phone over and just hold it up to my ear? Okay. Hello? Hi. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, she can come to my office tomorrow at nine so I can take a look at the wound. Oh, wait a second, I think I have a meeting at nine. Can you look at my calendar please and see whether we can move that meeting? Or maybe the patient could come afterwards at 10.30? Why, why don't we do that? Okay, great. The, the what? Oh, right, the teaching session is at 10.30. Is she on the line waiting? All right, maybe we could get the CT scan first and then she could come see me in the afternoon afterwards. Oh my goodness, this is taking so long. Couldn't they just tell the patient the surgeon is busy doing an operation and can talk later? Now I'm gonna to have to use more paralytic and then it'll look like my fault if the patient is slow to wake up. I wish this conversation was in. This is really inappropriate. Can't they figure this out in 30 minutes when this case is over? My arm is getting tired holding this phone. I need to get the next patient on call and I need to start organizing the counts. Oh, this is the world's nicest patient and obviously she ends up being the one who has this complication. Poor woman. We've been playing to phone tag for the past two days straight. I just wanna make sure she's seen in case this wound opens up again. The case is nearing the end. The surgical resident will be closing the wound. The surgeon needs to go to the office to see a patient. The post-op debriefing needs to be completed 
and the anesthesia attending is speaking with the anesthesia resident about what happened during the case. Can we do the debriefing? Yeah, let's uh, let's do that. I need to get to my office. So this case is a perfect example of how we really need to check twitches carefully. Can we before do the rehearsal. debriefing? Because depending on where the electrodes are placed, sometimes you can be fooled by direct muscle stimulation rather than real nerve stimulation. I made this mistake once during my residency, and the patient ended up having weakness after extubation, and we almost had to reintubate. I see. I understand. I wish they would just pay attention. I'm sure their discussion is important, but so is this debriefing. I need the information in this debriefing. Why do they keep talking and ignoring me? How loud do I need to talk to get their attention? It is really important the anesthesia resident understands this because I want to make sure the patient is okay after I gave that extra paralytic. I've had a problem before and we need to do everything we can to make sure our patients are safe. All right. So, um, once again, by the way, let me please invite our colleagues who are tuning in via the Q&A to please pop some things into the Q&A regarding the reactions. And uh, Maureen and Denise and I will, will be chatting with you. So um, Maureen, how about if I toss it over to you to get some initial reactions? Okay, great, thanks, Jenny. All right, um, what, are we, what are your reactions to that? Does that sound familiar to anyone? I see smiles. Yeah. Does this never happen to you guys? Because it happens to us. I think everybody's right. I think all of their all of their thoughts are a hundred percent correct. Um, but life is challenging, so it's a question of, you know, how do we streamline things? How do we try to minimize uh, interruptions? How do we uh, minimize distractions? But but I think they're all valid um, things to 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 work on. You know, I, the the technologists should get better training. Um, that the surgeon shouldn't get phone calls during cases. Uh, so I think distraction is, is amazing these days. Uh, that's that's my little tidbit. But um, so I think anything we can do to minimize distraction is a goal these days for everyone. Okay, good. Challenging and distractions. What are the reactions? And by the way, when we invite your just uh, reactions, they don't have to be very well thought out. And in, in fact, it's almost better if they're not. It's just like, whoa, what came to your mind after you watched that? So the one thing that kind of popped out to me the most was that there's a bunch of learners um, in this scenario, uh, probably in every level except for the surgical level. And so, my reaction here is it's a great reminder that as much training and learning that we did to get to where we are, even though what we do we think is probably the most important aspect of the patient's care, there's a ton of other learners that have to learn their part as well. So um, I think that's a, a, it was a great reminder of everyone's opportunities to learn are equal. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Rest of the team. Yep. Something that I thought about um, was coordination, not necessarily prioritization of everyone's jobs because they're all equally important. Um, but how can we coordinate them such that you know you will still be able to get the same learning without, and also be able to have, you know. So, um, Maureen, Verna, your mic got bad about five yeah. seconds ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maureen, um, I, I've got a bunch of reactions down here. I'm just going to share oh, my screen great. for a sec. Okay. And then if you feel like uh, moving us along to the types of outcomes that might have been influenced by these, okay. the sitch. All right. So, what are the other? Uh, we have coordination, we have distractions. Okay, so um, what do you think about the outcomes for this uh, this particular team, this team working in this OR? What, what do you think, if, if this continues on, what, what do you think of the outcomes that would be impacted? It's a complicated case, the outcomes might not be great. 
If it's a complicated case, the outcomes may not be great. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if it's simple, chances are, it, you know, distractions aren't a huge deal with simple cases. It's just yep. honest. You get this uh, sort of like development of factions, so to speak. So it's the us versus them kind of mentality. There's a surgeon, there's an anesthesiologist, and there's a nursing team. Whereas like instead of over time with this kind of resentment, you're going to have like separation and people are going to think their job is more important um, rather than, okay, all our jobs put together is the most important. So, Right. Like um, uh, that, that's a good thought. I think um, that we all have the, the best outcome in mind for this patient, but I think that we all as um, separate disciplines also have specific tasks that we need to do during the case. And sometimes they, those tasks are not appreciated by the other, or, or understood is probably a better word, mm -hmm. by the other, uh, the other role groups. You know, Maureen, Maureen I've, I have the luxury I'm participating here. I was inspired <laughs> by what Jonathan just said. Today in my work, I worked with four different hospitals and health systems, and every one of those um, has big time morale issues and big time kind of personnel crises. Um, and I really worry about those factions that Jonathan was talking about just leading to, you know, not great experiences and contributing to burnout, which is just undeniable. I mean, we, the days of denying burnout are like long, long, long past it. So I'm in the mood to like challenge this super high performance group of people and say, what can we do that's radically different? So not just like slightly better things to say and do, but what, what might we brainstorm that's radically different to improve the experiences that we're having in our teams? Um, so we keep those nurses on the job and, and contribute to thriving um, in, in our roles in the OR. Like what are some things that we can do differently? And I love the fact that we're on with residents right now. Like what are some things that your generation of clinicians can do that's radically different not just a little bit different or some incremental step but really totally different in the way that you build your teams and have your days no pressure guys yeah yeah no what what do you mean by radically different what do you, what are you looking for are you looking for I mean, a new like, novel idea or I mean, yeah I, like um have I one person on the or we could all never take call. We could all never take phone calls. Yeah. Have, <laughs> um, have either one person run the yeah. OR or have everyone just very calm and very happy, get out early, start whenever we want. <laughs> but, but I think your point of, of like the radical idea is just kind of be aware, be more aware of what, um, what impact we may be having on the nurse, the OR tech, the OR tech student, the anesthesia, the anesthesia resident, all those people having awareness of our, of um, you know, uh, the impact of our, of our actions. Yeah. I, Tamar, to your point, um, and to explain radical a little bit better, not like unachievable radical, but, um, an example of something that was done that I was a part of and got to see up close was there was a surgeon in Boston children's hospital that was noting, um, issues within teams and some morale issues. This was about five years ago. And one simple change that was made that was actually really radical in the culture was in the in the timeout before the surgery, instead of saying, does anybody have any concerns? No, no concerns. All right, we're good to go. All right, let's start. That was zero seconds of actually stopping to listen for concerns. And, and that became very normal. Instead of doing that, saying, let's hear one concern from every member of the team related to this type of case or this specific case. And it didn't take a lot of time. And it was a totally radically different thing to do. But it wasn't like from outer space. You know, so that's an example of something that really improved the culture of one surgeon's teams. And Chris, if I could, um, not only hearing what those content of those concerns are, but one thing that Chris and I study and our colleagues study is what leads to speaking up. And one of the most robust findings is actually crazily simple, which is, if somebody speaks early in a meeting or early in a procedure or during the huddle, they are more likely to speak up later. 
So I think that's a secondary reason why that's such a cool idea, Chris. Yeah, that was the idea of, a, of this really great person who's a surgeon. Yeah, I'd love to say it was my like scientific teamwork idea, but it wasn't. So I'm read a comment, sorry, in the Q and A. Great. Right. Does that work? Please. Having teams be routinely evaluated and assessed and then provide feedback, make receiving feedback about teamwork a normal occurrence. I I actually I think that's a great idea, Caitlin. Um, one of the things that we were thinking about looking at at Mass General or in the system that we're in is um, doing the Pulse 360s for teams. So Pulse 360, for those of you who are not familiar, is actually like a um, uh, I don't know, an eval from all of your colleagues about how you are as a colleague and a leader, et cetera. And so you get it from theoretically all people that work with you, above you, below you, and you, they collate all that information. And, and one of the things we're thinking about doing is doing it for the team. So, and, and so you would, if you as a surgeon would get um, uh, reviewed by all the people kind of on your team um, and vice versa and all around. And so you really get to see how your team as a whole works together and, and whether your performance overall, the culture is good you know, to get feedback for it. We haven't done it yet, but I think that concept is great. I wanted to say something that actually feedback it could be one of the strategies to address it. So in general, I was thinking um, what brings, what provides the satisfaction or having a good day as uh, Chris brought it up. I think it's the balance between expectations and fulfillments. So if you are not aware of expectations of the team, uh, we're losing one part of the equation and then the fulfillment by itself is another part. So getting feedback kind of addresses uh, the first part, which we can understand expectations of the team members. For example, we have, um, uh, let's say an instructor and a, uh, a student in the team so the expectation of the student is totally different from uh, other uh, members. So if you are aware of that, then we can uh, provide um, good uh, strategy to address it. So in order to, uh, I mean, in general, I think uh, we need to be aware of those things. And I think the surgeon as a leader of the team um, basically has more responsibility to take care of all those expectations ahead of time. He has to know who is going to be in the room and what are the expectations in general and then address that appropriately. Thanks, Mohammed. One of the words that I put to that in my teamwork thinking is um, discovery. Like if a leader can make a very quick discovery move um, and put it out to the team, the sharing of concerns, is one way to do that. But what that basically is, it's an invitation for you to tell me something about the way you're viewing this case or an invitation for you to tell me something about the way you're viewing this team or this day. Um, so if I, as the surgeon were to say, Jenny, if you could change one thing about the way we're set up right now, what would you change? That's an invitation and it's a discovery process. That's the way I view it as a teamwork scientist. I'm going to learn something from this talented teammate that I have with that invitation that I just asked. Jenny might say, I would change nothing. I feel good about the setup. Or Jenny might say, you know what? I would change one thing. Let me tell you what it is. But how can we get that discovery into our, into our practice so that we're giving voice to the team, we're allowing people to participate, and we're actually getting that good information to do a better job? Um, team, before we leave this green column, and uh, Maureen and Denise, feel free to shape what I'm asking here. Uh, I would love to come back to just the reorientation or the refocusing of that particular team. We had a couple different moments. There was the moment when the surgeon was on the phone. There was the moment when they were trying to do the debrief and the anesthesia team was talking about the paralytic. Um, there was the beginning moment where the uh, scrub tech and the nurse, uh, senior nurse, were trying to figure out how to do the device. 
Each one of those were important as one of you so wisely noted at the beginning, yet at the same time, they prevented the team from having a unified focus at that moment. Thoughts about what you could say or do to re, um, reunify the team at a moment like that. Or negotiate reunification even, I'm not sure what the right thing would be there. But. Or maybe I would say, what have you seen done? I think sometimes when you're trying to suggest for things that can be improved, it helps to say what you like about what happened. And, uh, and then bring up the fact that, hey, what do you guys think about doing things differently next time? You know, um, you want to make it open, but then you also want to bring out something positive about what happened so that people feel appreciated and they feel more open to bring up about things that they feel like, um, you know, could be contributing to something positive things. Yeah. So Jisoo, you're talking about if once the procedure's over, looking back, how might we uh, learn and change? I think that's great. So some appreciation and some reorientation. How about yeah. in the moment, in any one of those moments, thoughts about how to reorient the team there? I think asking a question uh, kind of triggering the minds of people around a question, which is a, could be the answer. You don't have to be uh, directly provide a point or invite people. Maybe just ask question and then the answer uh, would be something that you want. So that way you, you, you will be polite and at, <clears throat> and at the same time bring the attention of the people. I think it's uh, important to. Sorry, um, I hope I hope I didn't interrupt. Um, Go ahead, Jonathan. You're I good. think it's important to realize, like the nursing staff was trying to do a debrief, which is like, I mean, it, it was an important part of the whole process of the operative theater. And the anesthesiologist had a great point where he was trying to teach like a personal life lesson that he learned from his training, and impart it upon the anesthesia resident. So I think the best part would have been so needed to recognize that there was a very important thing that the nursing staff needed to do. Uh, very important lesson that anesthesiologists wanted to impart. And no one spoke up to say, hey, let's all like stop for a second. I think we need to do a debrief, but anesthesia had a good point. Uh, do you mind sharing with everyone? Like, you know, not just to be like in a rude way, but just so that everyone's on the same page, like everyone has good points and good lessons, but just so that everyone can be on the same page, especially at the end, because, you know, you can have a great start to a song, a good climax, but you don't want it to like peter out. You want it to have like a good finish. So, Right. I think this is a is an easy example to talk about it because it doesn't seem like it was a super high risk inter not intervention but high risk uh, or a, an acute period and I find when I'm in a scenario where it actually time matters I just make an announcement that it's not a teaching time it's not teaching time and I frequently will say that it's not teaching time. And I say it to my residents and I say it to everyone in the room. There'll be time for teaching later. This is not teaching time. And it just gets everyone to kind of hone in and recognize that, yeah, there's gonna be cases where you can be laughing and showing everyone the equipment. And then there's other times that they're just not. And I don't know if that's the best way about it, but everyone just knows that it's it's time to be serious. Thanks, Jessica. So in, in teamwork terms, basically what you're doing is you're setting the task, you're framing the work. You know, sometimes the work is all about learning. Sometimes the work is all about doing and framing that is part of the leader's work is framing what are we doing right now? 
So we're debriefing right now and let's pull in that anesthesia point. We're not doing teaching right now. We've got to close, whatever it might be. So thank you for that idea. All right, uh, I think we're gonna wrap up that um, scenario and discussion. Um, Denise, Maureen, do you wanna have any final words before we toss it back for our open discussion? Um, no, so Maureen, you go first. Nope, I think we covered everything. Uh, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, no, I just wanna thank everyone on the panel for sharing. I think it was a really rich discussion and um, I'll pass it over to Chris. Yeah, this group is great. Um, I wish we could have you guys for other courses and, and uh, do some more things together. So I'm so glad Jenny's taking notes. I just, I, so we're gonna move into some general discussion. This is the end of the course. We're gonna close it up here. Um, and what we're gonna do is start to think about what we might take back to our practice in terms of a behavioral experiment, all right? What do we mean by behavioral experiment? So the idea is, you swap in a new behavior, something you're going to try saying, something you're going to try doing, and you collect data. It's your own little experiment. You say, did, did that work? <laughs> and if it works, you keep it in there. And if it doesn't work, you pull it back out, all right? So the idea is to have some, some small experiment for yourself. And um, thanks for tolerating my challenge of doing something like totally radical, man. But um, I do think it can be useful to think yeah, what, what do we just never do around here? Because we have a culture and cultures are composed of norms, those things that are normal. And when, when, when we're coming up through the ranks and learning how to be part of a culture, what we generally do is adopt the norms, not question them. And then we've got these needs to change our norms and kind of do things differently and do things better. And I think the healthcare um, employment crisis, which is actually worldwide, is a call for us to do things differently. So what might we try that's different that will help us in our team, that will help us in our unit, in our hospital, in our healthcare system, and ultimately in our world? It's a small goal, but you know. So um, I think it's really exciting to think about that. You guys are brilliant. It's really nice to spend some time with you. And um, I don't know, I, I'd love to hear so the way adult learning works, we know that is you come up with some ideas now, but you'll also have most of your great ideas will happen tomorrow. Um, and in the coming days, as you have a chance to go back to your workplace, have a look at your teams and be like, aha, there's the opportunity right there. But what are some of the thoughts you're having right now about, I don't know, what's, what, you're, what you're working on, what you're inspired by, what you might change, what you might think about doing differently back in practice? And I just want to put that out, open question to you, and uh, just hear what you have to say. Any order. And can I you know. Please weigh in. Sorry. That's okay. I was just going to say, I know that one of the things that frustrates me the most when I'm like hyper acutely aware of it is when, so I don't have a team that I work with consistently. It sounds like many of you um, do have very consistent teams and the same scrub and the same anesthesia. It's just not part of my job. And I know that it's my bias when I walk in the room and everyone assumes that I'm the resident and that I'm not the attending. It, that to me is like one of those cases of a bad start. Um, so, I think for me, this was very insightful because I'm going to really focus on how I decide to react to when we, there's a bad start and whether I turn the tone into something that is going to be, yep, I'm upset that you assumed that I was the resident or the nurse and not the attending um, and maybe just make a joke about it. and and not make everyone in the room feel bad about it, um, particularly if we're going into a tough case that's happening in the middle of the night. You know, Jessica, thank you. That's such a, in a way, um, I'll just use the word generous share, because I think when those kind of identity, I don't know if you experienced this way, but sort of identity threat moments happen, it's dang hard to be gracious about it. Um, you know, you worked hard to get where you are and it's, it's 
you know, I, I love your idea of using some humor there. And I love the idea of seeing it potentially, you know, whether it's, are you the resident or are you the something else? Whenever we, any of us experience an identity threat, um, I've noticed in myself when I feel threatened in this particular way or what other people do, what I call an identity snarl. People are kind of like, man, don't talk to me like that. Or, you know, there's a sort of intensity to how they react. And I love your discipline or your, your thought that, you know, requires a reset on your part. Uh, to make the team still roll along well. Super high skill. I just wanted to add quickly that what's what I like about these little um, videos is that you actually see, well, first of all, you take yourself out of the situation that we all experience all the time. So you kind of see how that what's going on and and see it from a you know standing 30,000 feet. But the other one is that the um, thought bubbles are also really important, right? Because normally when you're in the OR, you're not hearing people's thought bubbles and what their frames are. And so I think all of these do let us, I mean, each time we do this course, I think about the effects of, you know, when I walk in the room and how, I, what I, what's going on in my mind, other people's minds, how that's all that complex interplay, which is different every single day, depending on the group of people that you're working with. So thanks for that. So I think that's really insightful. Agreed. So a few more thoughts about, you know, quick five second, 10 second thoughts about your takeaways or what you're thinking about. I think this was actually pretty insightful. Uh, for me, uh, it felt kind of refreshing knowing that, okay, like, you know, these problems, they're, they actually happen everywhere. It's not just in, in the OR that I'm in or just this hospital, you know, this problem is that ubiquitous. So, you know, taking this lesson moving forward, I think, for me personally, I would try to be, okay, you know what, there's a lot of things that I can do to improve when I'm working with a new team and such, you know, I might as well try to get used to it and just get better at it. And you know, I think this was pretty good, you know, seeing that. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, and I think uh, just, you know, it goes a long way to saying, you know, the attitude and setting the tone um, at the beginning really does like, can have an effect, you know, what happens during the case and then throughout the day. Um, just not to forget that. I mean, we all have difficulties and struggles and are frustrated uh, a lot with what we do, but, you know, just the attitude can change a lot of things. And uh, I really like the way you started this uh, with three examples of uh, music performances. Uh, just looking at different options of attitude and behavior in front of us as a sample is very, uh, I think, helpful. I think we, um, I might use this technique to develop variables in my mind before acting upon a situation, probably. So that could be my takeaway. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, I'll share a couple of things that, that I kind of uh, took away from this, um, just how important communication is and how powerful um, our impact can be, whether uh, good communication, bad communication, like we're saying, setting the tone, um, maintaining the OR, the vibe overall being approachable so that everyone feels that they can contribute, they can share um, anything that they want to share or any concerns, like you said. Um, and then also um, acknowledgement of other people, what they're going through as well as what we're going through. Um, so I think those are very important things. I think sometimes it's hard to remember, um, but I think it's that it's key to the success in the OR and as, as well as outside the OR. Thanks, Tamar. I just wanna read Berna's comment in the um, comment section. For me, holding the basic assumption, just like in SIM, and trying to uncover your team's frames behind their actions or words, having awareness of your team's mood and thinking of what you can do to improve it. Great mm, stuff. Enough. I know, Bernie, your mic doesn't have to work. You just throw your voice and I can read it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> when your mic's not working. <laughs> Berna, so great to have you here today. I, I think, um, you know, this idea that our team is are thinking things and we don't have the thought bubble feature out in the real world. So what can we say and do to 
invite people to share what they're feeling, share what they're thinking, share what their ideas are. And so that's, you know, helps us to clarify, helps us to unify, helps us to have the best ideas in the team and move forward. All right, everybody, Denise, to you for closing words. Um, first of all, thanks to all of the panelists, the ones that we dragged on stage and the ones that volunteered or were voluntold by Brian, um, hopefully have good feedback. Um, and uh, anyway, it was really nice. We, we were trying this out. We want to do something different for the webinar. We usually do this in little breakout rooms um, and we didn't know how best to do it in webinar format, but um, it, it all worked out perfectly. I could not have imagined it going any better. And for the audience, hopefully um, this was a good interactive kind of a um, setting and a format. And hopefully you were able to learn a lot by the, um, the kind of didactic-ish portion that we came up with. But also I think the panelists taught us all as much as you know we did as faculty. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to my team, um, Chris, Jenny, Maureen for being dragged into this. I was like, oh, we have a Sages Raft webinar. <laughs> do you guys want to go? Let's give this a shot and try to do this for OR teaming. So um, thanks to everyone. And um, I hope you're able to take some things home um, back to your institutions in your day to day. I hope to see a lot of you at Sages uh, in a couple of weeks. And if you're not members already, um, please consider joining and feel free to reach out to me. Um, lots of great, uh, committees and opportunities there. Um, Jenny, Maureen, Chris, anything else? Thanks folks, take care. Definitely hope to see you around. I said, thank you. Uh, have awesome. a good evening, everybody. Nice to work with you. Take care, have a great night. Thanks so much. Bye, All right, thank you for having us.